In March 2011, a record 9.0 earthquake struck just off the coast of Japan, triggering a massive and devastating tsunami and killing nearly 16,000 people. Not only was the earthquake one of the worst environmental disasters in history, but in the moments that followed, the world watched in horror as a massive wall of water crippled the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. In the days ahead, the crisis only heightened, and a series of explosions confirmed the worst fears, a full-blown meltdown of three of the plant's nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, both the Japanese government and the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, have gone to great lengths ever since to downplay the disaster and continuously cover up the true severity of the crisis. Even today, there is no end in sight to the fallout, and the cleanup process is far from over. Furthermore, conflicting reports on radiation levels make it incredibly difficult to know what's really going on. Just this month, the Radiation and Public Health Project reported that the level of thyroid cancer in children, an ailment directly associated with exposure to radiation, is 40 times above normal for children near the site. Yet three years after the earthquake and subsequent tsunami, we're left with more questions than answers. To help me sort through some of them, I'm joined by Paul Gunter, Reactor Oversight Director at Beyond Nuclear. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Abby. So, a couple of years ago, TEPCO actually admitted itself that 300 tons of radioactive water is spilling into the Pacific Ocean every day. I mean, following your assessment and, and from everything that we've been hearing based on the leaks, uh, what do you think is going on right now? It's sort of a nightmare version of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where Tokyo Electric Power Company has completely lost control of basically two sources of radioactive water that are flowing into the plant and these three destroyed reactors and then flowing out back into the Pacific Ocean. One flow is from all the cooling water that's washing over these three melted cores to keep the accident from blowing into another full-blown catastrophe. The other source of water is groundwater flowing into the wreckage and you know they basically have lost control of all this. They've been trying to pump it into this huge tank farm um, that's now probably more than uh, 1,500 tanks um, that are accumulating water saturated with radioactive strontium, cesium, and, and they've been trying to filter this out in a, in a test uh, procedure, an experiment that's going on there to try to uh, gear up so they can filter radioactivity out. But again, this is only a test. It's been up and down. It's broken. It's failed. It's leaked. And, and this is ongoing. I think, Paul, once people see the process, that's when it really settles in of how horrific the situation really is. Because, yeah, they're, they're, they're filling up fresh water to cool the reactors and putting all the radioactive water into these tanks. There's literally thousands of these tanks um, on site. And a thousand of those tanks are leaking. So we have <laughs> disaster after disaster on top of that, the contaminated soil that's being uh, gutted and packed in plastic bags. No end in sight. What are they going to do when they run out of room to store this radioactive water, Paul? Well, there is really no management plan here at all. This is, again, it is, it's an experiment. All the liability is going to be shifted to the future, future generations that are going to be left with this legacy without any benefit. But uh, clearly, uh, right now, um, the uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company is able to uh, basically control the information while the accident remains out of control. Mm. And that's a big concern. That is a big concern. They've been really tight-lipped on a lot of things, Paul. Um, let's talk about the ice wall um, that's, that we keep hearing about. It's 1.5 kilometers of underground ice being built to keep the soil around the reactors frozen. I mean, what are the major problems with this idea? Well, again, this is another experiment. Uh, it's unprecedented to use this kind of technology, which has a very limited uh, history where they've been able to freeze uh, ground under large bodies of water so they, they could dig tunnels. But again, this is just a temporary procedure. We're talking about um, putting um, piping down to bedrock, 90 feet down into the ground, uh, spacing these pipes every three feet for more than a mile uh, to put a perimeter that then they will pump refrigerant into the pipes to try to get the uh, 
uh, the temperature down to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're anticipating that this will then freeze the water that's flowing from the mountains behind the Fukushima Daiichi site and, and form a wall. But already, um, you know, a, um, a procedure that there's, they say they're scheduled for completion in March of 2015 um, has already broken down in, in the initial uh, testing phase, and they're not able to get the refrigerant down to that level of, um, of freezing. So again, this experiment right. is going to, you know, project it to now last for decades uh, while they try to bring that uh, groundwater flow under control. And what about the children in Fukushima? As I mentioned in the intro, uh, they're experiencing 40 times higher rates of thyroid cancer. I was wondering if we could talk about what radiation does to the human body. Well, you know, there is a whole host of uh, cancers, diseases uh, that are caused by uh, ionizing radiation to the, not only to organs, uh, but to the DNA. And clearly the, the uh, thyroid uh, gland is recognized even by, you know, by the American Thyroid Association uh, as being particularly vulnerable in children to exposure to radiation. And uh, you know, what we're seeing is, uh, without question, a spike that uh, in, in the incidence of thyroid cancer in children and young, um, uh, particularly the, the younger children. But it's, um, you know, again, we, uh, we're seeing uh, now three years in the accident already a spike in early onset. This, this kind of uh, onset can go on for decades right. now. So we're, we're only seeing the initial climb in this uh, spike of disease. Paul, earlier mentioning TEPCO, the extreme secrecy, the tight lip on information, the censorship, and they were even hiring Yakuza mob members to pay back debt um, to do the cleanup process. People who are completely inexperienced with actually how to do that. Um, what about the disinformation campaign? And then you hear the other side of the story, which is that it's so bad it's going to poison everyone on the West Coast, everyone stop eating fish. I mean, I guess sort through kind of what we know and I guess, uh, you know, the assessment of how bad this really is for people on the West Coast. Well, I think that what we have seen is that, uh, uh, once again, when the uh, powers that be lose control of their reactors, they look to control the information. And uh, this has been true with every nuclear accident that we've seen to date, uh, Fukushima only being the most recent, but clearly uh, perhaps one of the most worrisome. The, um, uh, you know, they had, the government had the um, wherewithal for uh, looking at the weather, looking at the release rates of radiation in Fukushima, and then projecting where those radioactive clouds were going to go. But they withheld that information from the public. You had entire populations spontaneously evacuating from one zone, but moving into the radioactive cloud because the government withheld information. Tokyo Electric Power Company um, has been time and time again uh, revealed to uh, basically show that it has no control or knowledge of the radiation levels that are releasing from, from this wreckage. And, and it's our concern that it's actually deliberate, that they're withholding information, that they're misconstruing it as incompetence when in fact is deliberate. Oh, no doubt. Um, and, and you know, I can't help but think of the 23 sister reactors from uh, that GE also owns and operates almost nearly um, identical design, excuse me, to the Fukushima reactors here in the U.S. Uh, are we going to be <laughs> awaiting a, a potentially kind of the same disaster that Fukushima experienced? I mean, what can we do to shut these down? We have about 45 seconds left. Well, you know, I think the basic concern is, is that uh, we have uh, 23 of these Mark 1s and we have eight more of the Mark 2s, which was Fukushima Daiichi Unit 6. But um, these reactors, from the very beginning, we've known, don't have containment. Uh, these reactors, if faced here in the United States with a, a significant fire, uh, a break uh, in a dam that floods the reactor site, uh, we could see as bad or worse an, an accident. And as we see with Chernobyl, the sarcophagus is, is cracking. There's no way to store this safely. There's no way to really do this safely. So thank you so much, Paul Gunter, Reactor Oversight Director, Beyond Nuclear. Appreciate it.